Alright, good morning. Welcome to week two of this very, very weird semester. Uh, we're going to talk about early Virginia today. This is um, really the beginning of European and specifically English colonization. And it all starts with Roanoke Island. Uh, the English are kind of late getting into the colonization game, but they really make up for lost time. And the first English attempt at colonization is in 1584, and it's a really interesting story that I cannot possibly give enough time to right now. But in 1584, this guy named Sir Walter Raleigh goes to Queen Elizabeth I and asks permission to go and explore North America. Um, between Sir Walter Raleigh getting permission and some money from the Queen, he puts together this voyage that lands in what would be today North Carolina. Um, the voyagers, they go along the coast of North Carolina. They find this island. They get off the boat. They look around and say, hmm, this is a great place to put a colony. So Walter Raleigh and his explorers go back to England, put together 117 men, women, and even children. And in 1587, they sail back to North Carolina. The leader of this colonization effort is a guy named John White. He sets everything up, and about a month later, he goes back to England expecting to get more supplies and more people. Well, while John White is sailing back to England, the war, a war breaks out with Spain and it cuts off all sea traffic. So Roanoke Island is forced to survive by itself for three years before John White can come back. When John White comes back in 1590, he discovers that there's nothing left except for a couple cannon, a couple of open chests, and the fence that surrounded the settlement. Nobody knows what happened to them. They just disappear. There's no trace left. The only written evidence of what happened is on a fence post, or some people say on a tree post, there was a carving that said Croatoan, and nobody knows what Croatoan means. Now there are, however, a couple of theories. Uh, one theory is that the people of Roanoke just left the settlement. Um, it's actually kind of a probable theory. Um, the idea is they took apart the buildings, they used them to make boats, and then they sailed further north. The evidence of this is some of the local natives say, yeah, we saw these fair-skinned people moving. And then Further north in the Chesapeake Bay area, the natives there say that, yeah, we, we killed some people who invaded our land. So it could be true. Another theory is that the population of Roanoke Island was killed off by disease. Not as likely because disease is not going to take away the buildings and all the buildings were gone. So it's kind of ridiculous, but it is a theory that's out there. Another theory is that the village was destroyed by a hurricane or a severe storm. Well, that would be the most selective storm ever to leave the fence, but take away all the buildings in the middle, so probably not that. Another theory is that the natives went and invited the settlers to live with them. And then there's a fifth one that just the colonists were wiped out by the Native Americans. So. Of those five theories, we really don't know which one it is, but a couple are more likely than others. <clears throat> so, the English try again. In 1606, King James of England, he's going to charter something that's known as the Virginia Company. This is basically a joint stock company like we have today people buy shares in a stock and then they expect to make profits. 
Now, what were the people who invested in the Virginia Company expecting? Well, they were expecting gold, wine, citrus, olive oil, and maybe a way to get to China so that they could make even more money. So, 1607, you got three ships with 100 men and men only. They're going to settle the Jamestown colony. Basically, they go to the Chesapeake Bay, they find a river, they sail up 40 miles of the river, and they name it the James River. They find what looks like is a nice place to build a city, and they get off and they name the new settlement Jamestown. Now, Jamestown is basically just a fort, a couple of huts with straw or thatched roofs, a storehouse to keep all the stuff they were going to find, and a church because it's old. Now, once again, all the settlers are male. They're what were called gentlemen, and that meant that they didn't farm, they didn't work. They were there to make money and then go home. There's a guy named John Smith who's leading them. You might know him from Pocahontas fame. And if you're a fan of the movie Pocahontas, I hate to break your hearts, but Pocahontas was very Disneyfied. Pocahontas was like a 13-year-old girl who was taken as prisoner by John Smith, forced to marry him, and then taken back to England to forcibly learn English. But uh, John Smith is going to become friends or at least allies with a local native leader named Powhatan. Uh, Powhatan, that wasn't his real name, but that's what we call him today. And he's going to trade with the English in hopes of gaining their support to defeat some of his enemies. Now, John Smith, he is not a politician. He's actually a military leader, and he's going to impose this really harsh discipline on the colonists. Basically, it boils down to no work, no food. Uh, in 1609, he's forced to go back to England. Some gunpowder blows up on him, burns his face really bad, and he has to go back to England to, uh, to heal. And when he leaves, everything falls apart. It's known as the starving time. And you don't have to be a historian to know that that probably means something bad happened. Uh, during the starving time, which happens in the winter of 1609 going into 1610, the colonists, they eat everything. When people from, return to Jamestown from England in the spring of 1610, they find that there are only 60 people left alive. Everything had been eaten, all the dogs, all the cats, all the rats, all the mice, all the poultry, all the livestock, even the horses had been eaten. And then there were reports from the survivors that they had to dig up the corpses and eat them. The new governor, uh, his name is Thomas Gates, he gets there, he's like, what the heck is happening? And he's going to institute these laws of Virginia that you have to read for this week. Basically, everything ends up in death. You speak out against the king, death. You speak out against God, death. If you don't do your work, death. If you don't go to church, death. Lots of death. I think you'll enjoy that reading. The colony is going to survive by 1610, everything kind of levels out, and by 1611, it's beginning to prosper and earn lots of money. By 1616, it is growing very well, and in 1618, there's this policy known as the Headright Policy that begins. Basically, if you paid your own way to Virginia, you got 50 acres, no questions asked. But if you paid the way for somebody else, say a servant, you got 50 acres for them too. And this headright policy is going to lead to this idea of indentured servitude. People who are less fortunate in England, or in Ireland especially, are going to be asked, do you want to go to the new world? You have a chance for a new life and new civilization. The only catch is you have to work off the cost of your so you might be a, a wealthy businessman, you pay for yourself to go to England, you might bring three or four servants that are going to work for you, so you get 250 acres out of it. That's plenty to start a plantation. Now if you are a servant, you're expected to work off the, coast, the cost of your village, or voyage, 
and you are probably going to work somewhere between three to seven years depending on the specific contract. But any stoppage of work adds time to the contract. Now, if you are a woman, there's a chance you're going to get pregnant. And if you're pregnant, especially at that time, you can't work for probably three or four months. That three or four months is added to the end of your contract. And if you get pregnant twice, that could be almost an entire year added to your contract. And they just find ways to do that. Plus the cost of your upkeep, your food, your supplies, your clothes, all of that is added into the cost of the contract as well. So what's supposed to be three to seven years on paper could sometimes be 15 to 20 years. Before 1675, over 75% of the labor force in Virginia was made up of indentured servants. Yes, there is some slavery, but slavery does not become the primary labor source until after 1675. Now what happens to the Virginia Company is dissolved by the king in 1624. And Virginia becomes known as a royal colony, which means it's under the direct control of the king. All right, political life. I know nobody likes to talk about it, but we have to just a little bit in history. First of all, these Chesapeake Bay colonies, it's Maryland, Virginia, and the northeastern part of North Carolina, right along the coast. They're all kind of the same. The biggest difference between Maryland and Virginia, Maryland is for Catholics. It's set up by a guy named Lord Baltimore. But for the most part, it runs almost the same way Virginia does. Some of the most important families from England come over here, and they become some of the most important families in American history. The Carter family, the Harrison family, who's had two presidents, the Lees, Robert E. Lee, the Randolphs, the Taylors. In fact, one out of every five presidents in the United States history can trace its lineage back to one of those families. So it's pretty impressive. Overall, the government is going to be focused on local politics. Yes, there is a royal governor who answers to the king, but they're very far removed from everything that's going on. There's a bicameral legislature, which means there are two houses. There's the House of Burgesses, and there's the Governor's Council. The House of Burgesses and the Governor's Council, they are supposed to advise the governor, and they're supposed to pass taxes. Then below that, you have local government. You've got mayors, if you will. You've got judges. You've got justices of the peace. Most Virginia residents have no contact with the royal government. They're going to be associating mostly with the local government. The basic unit of this local government is going to be the county court. The county court is going to be where the trials are held, and it's where the taxes are done or taken, I should say. The militia is formed. They're the ones who decide how to build the roads and to maintain them. And then the county court, they're going to be the ones in charge of local construction, too. I have to also mention the Church of England. The Church of England is there. There's a small political presence, but most people have very little to do with the church. As Virginia grows up, those first laws of Virginia are thrown away. New laws are put into place, and the church has less force in Virginia, even though it is still important. And that's mostly because there's a severe lack of ministers. We'll talk about that probably. I think it's on Wednesday when I talk about that. All right, before I tell you about daily life, I have to tell you what the word of the day is. The first secret word for this week is going to be heat, H-E-A-T, heat. It's going to be a very warm week. We're supposed to break 90 this week, actually. So your word of the day will be heat, H-E-A-T. So that's your first secret word of the week. There will be another secret word on Wednesday. All right, back to daily life. 
first thing about this whole daily life thing there's a lot of solitude it's populated very few and far between uh, the farms are pretty large because once again you get fifty dollars for each person you pay for to come over there aren't a lot of people so you don't get to see many neighbors the biggest events for everybody are going to church when you can and going to court it's like judge judy is the biggest thing in in early virginia there's also a lot of agriculture tobacco is going to become the most important crop there's this huge increase in tobacco uses usage both in virginia and back in europe and tobacco is so important it's actually used as currency people will pay for things in tobacco instead of gold silver or anything else tobacco is so profitable there are very few people who are going to grow food which can cause a problem because if not enough people have food to eat starvation can occur with domestic rel uh, relations there are very few women and women are in high demand there is almost no such thing as un an unmarried woman if a woman's husband dies there's an appropriate period of mourning but then that woman remarries and women have a lot of economic power and legal power because they can hold out for the best deal if there are three men trying to marry one woman that woman can negotiate and get what's best for her out of the marriage which is very kind of unique in early history like this and death is pretty commonplace it's it's not un unusual for death to happen just because of disease starvation conditions etc etc and as i said before yes there is slavery slavery is going to enter virginia around 1640 and the number of african slaves in the chesapeake bay area is going to slowly increase in number and then around 1675 slavery becomes the primary way that labor is done now one big reason why slavery is going to take over versus indentured servitude is Bacon's Rebellion. There is this uprising led by a guy named Nathaniel Bacon. It happened in 1675-1676. And Nathaniel Bacon, he is a planter. He lives kind of out on the frontier. And a lot of the people living on the frontier were indentured servants who wanted more land and wanted more power. Well, Nathaniel Bacon and some of his supporters are going to kind of manufacture, if you will, a an Indian uprising, a Native American uprising. The governor of Virginia in 1676 was this guy named William Berkeley. Uh, he was fairly f polite and friendly toward the natives. And when these retaliations start, where the Native Americans are going to begin attacking English settlements, William Berkeley says, everything's fine, don't fight back. Well, this makes people angry, and Bacon forms a mob, leads the mob to the city of Jamestown, threatens to kill the governor. The governor has, has to flee the city, and Bacon and his colonists, or his, uh, you know, rebellious group, they say, we're in charge now, and they issue something called the Declaration of the People of Virginia. Now, ultimately, not much happens in this rebellion, mainly because Bacon dies of dysentery. If you don't know what dysentery is, look it up. It's not a very pleasant death. And the rebellion falls apart when Bacon dies. Berkeley is able to come back to Jamestown and he takes the property away from the rebels and he has 23 men hanged. But the damage is already done. Um, an investigation happens. Berkeley is removed from being governor. And this is the first rebellion against the English government. But it's obviously not going to be the last because we're not English today. Now, last but not least, I've got to tell you real quick about the Carolinas. And it's one slide here. Um, the, the Carolina colony is formed in the year 1663, and it's known as a restoration colony. Now, notice I just said Carolina. That's because in 1663, uh, the new king, King Charles II, he gives land to eight of his friends who help him get his throne. Um, there's a whole big thing that happens from 
about 1645 to 1660 that is for world history so we won't go into it but just know there's a period of time in English history where there's no English king. King Charles II is going to be restored to his throne which is why this is known as the restoration. But when King Charles is restored to his throne he gives land in the new world to eight of his friends who get his throne back for him. And it stretches all the way from southern, the southern border of Virginia to Florida. And the southern part of the Carolina colony is very different from the northern part. The southern part of the colony, there's a city called Charlestown that is built. It becomes a very important trading port. And a lot of food that's grown in the Carolina colony is sent to the West Indies. A lot of the sugar and slaves from the West Indies are brought to the Carolina colony, to Charlestown. And from there, the sugar is going to be shipped over to England. The northern part of the Carolina colony is primarily made up of former indentured servants. They are much more poor than the people living in Charlestown. They establish small independent tobacco farms. There is slavery in Northern Carolina, but it's a much, much smaller amount than what you find in Charlestown. So the northern part of Carolina and the southern part of Carolina, both, they develop very differently from each other. And in 1712, the Lord Proprietors, the people who run the colony of Carolina, decide to split it into two parts. And in 1712, you get what is today North Carolina and South Carolina. All right, so that's your whirlwind tour of the formation of Virginia and how this whole English experiment begins here in the New World, but there's a lot more to cover. Um, anyways, there will be one more video on Wednesday and a PowerPoint posted on Wednesday. This week also, your first reflection paper is going to be due. You don't have to wait until Sunday to submit it. It can be submitted any time this week. If you have any questions on what to do on that, just send me an email or find me on Discord. Uh, until Wednesday, that's all I've got for you. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.